Good morning. <laughs> Sometimes you're not sure what to say, so just say good morning, you'll be fine. <laughs> good to see Andy. I saw you on Thursday night. A lovely guy. Uh, and why is this light so bright? I, I can't see you. But anyway, for the past few weeks, we have been talking from that's better, from the book of John. And uh, I like to take us back to chapter 1 of John. It's not a regression. I'm just going back to endorse, to support, and to reinforce what Pastor Jim and the other pastors have said. So um, I want to talk to a topic titled, Bear Witness, Bear Fruit. Now, it's going to be only four verses that we'll read this morning. But before I do so, let me just tell us a little bit about the world's perception of Christianity. Some people in the world believe that Christianity is nothing but a um, fanciful, out-of-date set of beliefs, uh, cleverly designed with fables and myths and fairy tales to, um, to help us live moral lives. That's what somebody, some people believe, but that's so far from the truth. Because the Bible tells us that Christianity is based on sound arguments about the person of Jesus Christ. That he is real, and not just real, he is relevant for us today. So this morning, I will talk about how God has provided irrefutable arguments for our faith. And because our faith is based on such a solid basis, we as believers ought to be witnesses of this faith. And I'll talk about three conditions, how we can bear fruit, as we bear witness for the Lord. So let's read John 1, verses 4 to 7. Just four verses. John chapter 1, verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Some verses said, some other translations say the darkness did not understand or did not overcome the light. But really, comprehend is the best translation. So I'm going to read it again. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. So firstly, let me ask a question. Why did God send a witness? Why God sent a witness? Why did he do that? Well, this man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light. First reason, it is hard for people in darkness to comprehend light. That's why God sent a witness. It's so difficult. Just two weeks ago, I had lunch with somebody uh, who is involved in ministering to inmates in the, in the prisons. And he said, he told me a story. Towards the, towards the end of this year, a man in his 50s would be out on parole from one of the prisons in Queensland. It all started when he was about five years of age. He was abandoned by his parents and shunted into home after home after home. By the age of 15, he was put into a correctional facility. Why? Because he was dealing with drugs. That's the only thing he knew, how to survive, deal with drugs, good money. Put into prison as a teenager, he killed another inmate. And now, because of that 
killing, that murder, he was put into harder facilities and solitary confinement and so on. It was hard for him to understand, to comprehend the light because people in darkness would see no end, no light at the end of the tunnel. That's, that's, that's the explanation for that verse. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. People suffering in darkness with violence, the evil betrayals in this world, they cannot understand the darkness. One day in that prison, someone came because God sent a man called John to bear witness. Somebody was sent by God to bear witness to this man in prison. The light bulb lit up. He gave his life to Jesus. You know what? He said, when I come out of prison by year's end on parole, I intend to go back to prison now as a witness now as a witness to the light. There's a second reason why God sent a witness. Here's the second reason. God takes believing seriously. God takes believing very seriously, and because of that, he sent many witnesses. The term witness or testify, that's translated in our Bibles in John's Gospel, occurs 47 times. It is a major theme in John's gospel. The, the term belief or believing or have belief occurs 100 times. And Pastor Jim correctly and ably presented to us that the purpose of John's gospel is so that we might believe. Believe in Christ. Believe in God. Now, how do we believe when people are in the dark? We believe through witnesses. God, through his Holy Spirit, could move upon anyone and convict. But his normal vehicle of, of communicating that grace is through witnesses. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. To bear witness is to show that something is real, something exists, and that something is true. The aim of witnessing is to help another person believe. That is the definition of witness, to witness, to bear witness. In a court of law, the role of witnesses is absolutely crucial to establish the truth. Credible witnesses confirm the truth. When a judge sums up in a court of law and sums the case up, he would remind the jurors, do not lean on speculation, do not lean on prejudice, do not lean on what the social media tells you. Examine the evidence. Listen to the witnesses in Christ, in the Christian faith, we have the most compelling set of witnesses available to establish truth. A Christian preacher and lawyer. He was a bivocational preacher. He, he's dead now, but he practiced law in Manchester, England. He said this. One day he was preaching. As he was preaching, he took a daffodil out and he ate it in front of the congregation. Everyone was aghast. What's happening here? And then he said to them, when this service is over, walk out to the police and say, this is what I saw the vicar, the preacher, do. He ate a daffodil in front of us. Would the police believe you? One boy raised his hand, little boy. He stood up and he said, yes, they would because there are lots of us here, and we saw you. Witnesses, witnesses, lots of us, we saw you. We saw you do this with our own eyes. The Bible, the Christian faith, 
is based on multiple witnesses. In fact, innumerable witnesses. I'll show you some of the verses here. John 8, verse 18, this latter part of that verse. The Father sent me, the Father who sent me, bears witness of me. God the Father bears witness of Jesus Christ. Look, the Holy Spirit bears witness. John 15, 26. The Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. That's witness. Testify and witness are the same thing. Translated from the same Greek word. Then we come to the Bible. John 5, 39. Jesus talking to the religious rulers of his day. He said this. You search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me, Jesus says. The word of God bears witness to me. The Old Testament contains 351 prophecies concerning Jesus Christ. Every single one of them has been fulfilled. Here are just some. Time doesn't allow us to tell you more. But here are some. It was prophesied of Jesus. He would be born of a virgin. That's what happened. It was testified of him, prophesied, that a friend who ate bread with him would betray him. And that's what happened. It was prophesied of him that he would be betrayed by, with 30 pieces of silver. And that's what happened to him. It was prophesied of him that he would be, his hands and his feet would be pierced. That's what happened. And these are only four. There are 351 of these, each one of them pointing to the truth. Jesus is real and Jesus is relevant. Our faith is not based on fables and myths. They are solidly grounded on Evidence. Evidence that's trustworthy. Look, there's another one. John 10, 25. These are the works of Jesus. The miracles he performed. God says, or Jesus says, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Two destinies await every man and woman, boy and girl. Two destinies and only two. Salvation, damnation. Now I know, I know that's a word that's not vogue today, but it's vogue in the Bible. Salvation, love, damnation, hell, judgment. And this is how the Bible puts it. Two fates await us. The Bible has made it clear God is serious about believing. That's why he's assembled a, a vast array of witnesses to confirm the truth. Jesus is the way. And to not believe him, we have only ourselves to blame. We can't say on judgment day, Lord, nobody witnessed to me. Nobody, I didn't know this. God will say, there are hundreds and hundreds. In fact, the Bible tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. They are bearing witness to the fact of God. Even though it's incomplete. The heavens bear witness to the fact of God. If you are a non-believer, in the verses we read earlier this morning, in Christ is life. John chapter 1 verse 4. And the life was the light of men. Do you believe Jesus is the light of men? That's the testimony of the Bible. Do you believe Jesus died for your sins? That's the testimony of the Bible. Do you believe there is only one way to heaven? That's the testimony of the Bible. Now we say that's only the Bible. Well, We ran out of milk the other day, and so we went to, the, to Coles, Woolworths, supermarket, and we said we're going to buy milk. We ran out of milk. A 
two liter carton, easy. So you look, today is the 14th of March. Supposing you go to Coles today to buy milk, 14th of March, you look, use buy, 15th of March. No, I'm not going to touch this carton. 27th of March, good. You take this one. You are deciding on the basis of testimony. You are deciding on the basis because somebody wrote some words down to tell you that cotton will be useless by tomorrow. Don't do it. We, we live our lives on the basis of testimony. We, we believe on the basis of testimony. Hear that God has assembled credible witnesses to tell us you will perish in your sin if you do not repent. And the Bible tells us one after the other, witness after another witness to say, take Jesus. He's your savior. He will save you from your sin. If we do listen to the testimony of the world, and if we do not listen to the testimony of God, we are of all men and women, boy and girl, the most foolish. If you're a Christian, you have Christ dwelling in you, because that's a fact. That's based on sound evidence and testimony. If you're going through tough times, trust in him. He has said, I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. That's his Word. God's word is sound, established on sound evidence. It is consolation for us. He'll never let us down. There is compelling evidence to dwell under the shadow of his grace and of his kindness. Stay the course. So there was a man sent from God whose name was John. God's purpose for us when we bear witness for Jesus, and because our faith is based on witness, based on evidence, not on fables. So God intends for us to be bearers of testimonies, to testify for him. When we bear testimony, when we bear, when we bear witness, we do not do so to win an argument. We, we do not do so to prove I'm I'm correct and you're wrong. Because that's not the motive. That When Jesus bore testimony concerning himself, this is his motive. And I'll read this to you. John chapter 5, verse 34. I bear witness concerning myself, Jesus says, so that you may be saved. That's his motivation. Not so that he can be seen to have won an argument, but so that you can be saved. John chapter 1 sets out the stories of the very first disciples who bore witness. The first person who, who bore witness to Jesus was John the Baptist. You remember that in the latter part of John chapter 1. He said, Behold the Lamb of God, pointing to Jesus and telling his two disciples, John and Andrew, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so, the Bible tells us, these two disciples followed Jesus. Later, Jesus met Philip. And he said to Philip, follow me. Philip followed. And he bore witness to Jesus by telling Nathaniel, we have found the Messiah. This is him. This is him. This is exactly what the Lord and the prophets were saying. Follow him. And eventually, Nathaniel followed. These were the first witnesses. Now, there are three conditions that are needed to be met to bear fruit as we bear witness. I want to share with you these three using the physical realm as the analogy. If you are a young couple, newly married, I'm speaking the old-fashioned way, okay? You get married, then you have children. Uh, these days, it's probably turned upside down. You have children, then you get married. But let's stay the old-fashioned way. 
a young couple gets married. There are three conditions to bear fruit. Number one, they must go for a honeymoon somewhere, lock themselves out from the world, and in that physical union, that's one condition, you get fruit. There's a second condition in the physical realm to bear fruit. There must be no hindrance, no disease that's associated with childbearing. If you've got some disorder, then you won't be able to bear a child. There's a third condition. There must be maturity. There, there are some people who are physically able to have a child, a 12-year-old, a 13-year-old couple, they can. But don't any one of you do it if you're 12 or 13. But 12 and 13-year-olds can, but they don't have the maturity to raise a child because to raise a child, to bear a child, Jesus says, I chose you, you didn't choose me, I chose you, so that you may bear fruit and that your fruit will remain. To, to have a sustained fruit, you need maturity. Children cannot. They don't have the patience. They don't have the maturity. They can't have the staying power to, to uh, stay focused. I remember when our son, Paul, had his second baby, our second grandchild, because mommy had the older child and mommy had just given birth. So Paul had to take care of Lucas. And Lucas was only probably 24 hours, year, 24 hours old or 36 hours old. And he said to us, Paul said, man, I was sleeping I was watching him, I was carrying him, sitting on the chair, and uh, it was tiring. I had to sacrifice, sacrifice, maturity, sacrifice. A young 12-year-old can't do it. And so I got the shock of my life, mom and dad. I almost dropped Lucas because he was at the cusp of dropping when I suddenly woke up in the middle of the night, 3, 3 a.m., 2 a.m., and I was shocked. I almost hurt him. So these are the three conditions to bear fruit in the physical realm. Let's look at the early witnesses and let's examine how they bore fruit. Those who bear fruit must be united with Christ. John 1.38, this is the case of John and Andrew. One, John 1.38, then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, what do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, where are you st staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Union with Jesus, united with Jesus. They remained with him that day. They spent the day with Jesus. You spend time with the Lord every day. If you want to be united with him, spend time with him every day. There are many hours in the day, and we can but only devote a small amount. And that's enough to keep us going, to be in union with him. Is Jesus everything to you? Well, the Bible, God took pains to cause us to believe because believing is the way to receiving his benefits and blessings. God took upon himself to make everything possible and we ought to make Jesus our everything. Do you spend time with him? Is he the master and the Lord? Do you, is his plans your plans? Here's a second condition to bear fruit as you bear witness. There must be no disorder. There must be no disability in the realm of reproduction, childbearing. There are some hindrances, spiritually speaking. The first hindrance is called apathy. I don't care. 
I don't care. Look at this. John chapter 1, verse 41. This is Andrew. Andrew, who had followed Jesus. This is what the Bible says. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother, Simon, and to bring him to the Lord. The first thing he did. That's the first priority with Andrew. There's no apathy here. There's nothing about, I don't care when, I've got, when, I, got, when I get the time. This is 41 down the list of my to-do. Uh, I'll, I'll deal with Simon then. But no, the first thing Andrew did was to speak to his brother, Simon. Another common disease is shame. Oh, I'm just ashamed of letting people know I'm a Christian. Man, God took everything in his power to assemble this vast array of witnesses to enable us to believe. And we are ashamed of him. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, his understudy, his disciple, and at least, at least five times he used this word, shame. Therefore, do not be ashamed of testifying about the Lord. Do not be ashamed of my chains. Therefore, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Paul says at least five times. Shame is a major disease. The greatest weapon, the greatest weapon the devil has against us Christians is not persecution. Trust me, it is not persecution. We were in China more than 10 years ago, and uh, they, they told us, the more they persecute us, the more we grow. Don't pray for a good life for us, because that will stop church growth. The greatest weapon is not persecution. The greatest weapon is shame. It's the greatest weapon. You know how? The devil knows we are human beings. We like to be loved. Everyone likes to fit in. We like to, uh, to be liked. Every one of us. But the devil can twist that natural desire and twist it into conformity. You better conform. If not, you'll stand, up like a, stand out like a sore thumb. That's how the devil can twist it to his gain. So, conformity, conformity. I want to conform. I, I just want to be like a normal family in, living in the suburbs. No one can tell the difference between me and them. Conformity, fit in, conformity. Those who bear fruit must exhibit maturity. Jesus found Philip. Now Philip finds Nathanael. John 1, 45. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathanael asked, Come and see, said Philip. Come and see. You know, maturity, patience, resilience. All of these are needed if you are a young parent. And it's the same thing that's needed if you are to bear fruit when you bear witness. Philip could have said, when Nathaniel said, Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Come of it, Philip. You think I'm a three-year-old? Nazareth. Now, Philip could have said, well, Lord, I did try, didn't I, Lord? I did. I did try to bear witness. All I got was a pushback. Okay, Nathaniel, take it or leave it. He could have done that. He didn't. Resilience. Patience. You want to bear fruit? Resilience. Dig in. In a nice way, of course. And so, I imagine, travel with me, this is what he said, Nathaniel, come. 
then we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law. We have found him. Look, in the law, Deuteronomy chapter 18, this is what Moses wrote. This is what Moses wrote. He said, the Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. I will put my words in his mouth. Listen to him. Nathaniel, we spend the day with him. Man, the words he spoke. He's one who sounded wiser, better than Moses. This is the one that Moses wrote about. Stay with me, Nathaniel. Nathaniel, now, didn't the, didn't the prophets write about him? Yeah, but Nazareth. Nazareth, that, that backwater, no good comes from that little backwater of a town. Look, Philip says to Nathaniel, didn't Isaiah and the other prophets said this? Didn't they say this? Didn't they say? Whole chapters have been written about him. Didn't Isaiah said, he will be despised and rejected by men. Here you are, you are proving it. You're rejecting him because he is despised from Nazareth. The Bible all, had already foretold this. Proving to him, proving to him, convincing him with evidence from the Bible. And then look at this, Nathaniel, look at this. About whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Look. He is the son of Joseph. And which tribe does Joseph come from? Judah. We have found him, Nathaniel. We have found him. Look, Micah 5.2. Didn't Micah 5.2 say about him? But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you might be small among the clans, clans of Judah, you are by no means inferior. For out of you will come a king, one who will be ruler over all Israel, whose going forth is from everlasting. It's a special word. He doesn't belong to time. Jesus doesn't belong to time. He is from time everlasting, before time was created, showing the deity and the divinity of Christ Jesus, that verse. So Philip stayed the course and endured all of that that, that shaming and, and ridicule from Nathaniel. Come and see. Come and see. And eventually, Nathaniel followed the Lord. You know, the devil hates fruit bearing. When Abraham was given a promise at the age of 75 that he'll have a child, when he was Childless, you'll have an offspring who would bear the godly line, who would reproduce and bless the whole earth. And uh, Sarah was barren. So here was a elderly couple, 75 and maybe 65 or thereabouts. And, and uh, God said to him, you'll bear a child. For 25 years, Abraham waited. I imagine the devil who heard that conversation would say, good, nothing is going to come out of this old man, old woman. No, 24 years have passed. Nothing's happened. Good, no godly line to replenish the earth. Because the devil is against fruit-bearing, godly fruit-bearing. But through a miracle, God woke up the womb of Sarah, and she conceived and bore, what's his name? Isaac. Thank you, Brad. Bore Isaac, and Isaac came into being, and Isaac was 40 when he uh, met Rebecca. It's not written in the Bible, but it may not be too fanciful to say that the devil immediately struck Rebecca barren. Because the Bible tells us for 20 years, you can do the maths, for 20 years, Rebecca remained childless. Because the devil dislikes fruit bearing, strikes Rebecca barren. And the Bible tells us Isaac prayed for his wife. For 20 years, he prayed, never giving up. And eventually, we know a nation was born. 
out of that seed of Isaac, the child of promise. God wants your Isaac, because through Isaac, a whole nation is born. Do you have an Isaac? I, I'm sharing this not to... It's hard when you, show, when you share personal stories, but I'm going to share this. Remember the spirit that I'm sharing from. Many years ago, there was, I was instrumental in bringing someone to the Lord. And uh, years... I'll keep going. I won't look. Years... There was many years ago, and um, years later, he reconnected with me. And he said, do you remember that night when you brought me to that Christian meeting? I said, I vaguely remember because that's so long ago. He said, it was raining. I was 50-50 going when you asked me to go to that Christian meeting. I wasn't a Christian, obviously. I was 50-50. And uh, he said, it was raining. Good, good excuse to not turn up. But you know what? You came to my house and you kind of like dragged me by my shirt collar and go. I said, to be honest, I can't remember that at all. I can't even remember it rained. But I'll take your word for it. So because you came and took me, I ended up in that meeting. And in that meeting, I gave my life to the Lord. I said, Oh, thank you for sharing that. That blesses my heart. And for quite some time, he would come to our house every Saturday morning. Becky would be in the kitchen doing breakfast for three, two of us plus him. And this was quite a regular feature. He would come because he was lonely, a uh, single fellow, and we were newlyweds. And so every Saturday morning, we did that in our tiny little home, which rented premises, which was bedroom, Bible study room. We, we held a cell group there, everything room. Okay, So we spent time, and I taught him, and I taught him. Years later, last year, he found out my first book had been translated into Burmese. And being in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, he said to me, may I have your permission to... There is a group of new Christians, 200 of them from Myanmar. Their visas have run out, and they need to be repatriated back to Myanmar, Burma. Can I have your permission to use your book to train these 200 brand new Christians so that when they get back, they can start doing Christian things? You know what I mean? So I said, Please go ahead. So he was doing it with a Burmese pastor and some other leaders who would in turn teach the 200. Patience. When you dig in, when you have an Isaac, through the intervening years, this person became a pastor. And I know for a fact, because every now and then he would send me pictures of the people that have come to the Lord Jesus through his ministry. Sometimes I'd show Becky, here's four today. Oh, last week four, here's six this week. Isaac, get your Isaac. Who's your Isaac? Because just one seed will multiply into a whole godly nation of believers. I want to pray for us this morning because our time is up. If you are a non-believer, make a decisive decision today. Take in the Lord Jesus. It is not based on myths and fairy tales, this faith of ours. In fact, it, makes a, it takes a thinking man and woman to embrace Jesus. Take Jesus in Ask him, Lord, this day I make a decisive decision. Come into my life. Be my savior. Be my Lord. It is as simple as that. If you have done that, I'd like you to do this. Would you come and let me know? Let Pastor Jim know. Pastor Randall, who's here. Or the one who's brought you this morning. Let them know. 
Let them know so that they can pray for you. Will you do that? And for us who are Christian believers, do not be ashamed. Do not have apathy. This is the greatest. People give their lives to causes. This is the greatest cause in the world because the Bible testifies and witnesses to the fact that Jesus is the Lord of everything. He holds the entire universe with his hand. What bigger cause can you have apart from Jesus? Let's pray. Lord God, just thank you for your word, that your word is truth. And uh, this morning, even as your word has gone forth, may it find residence in the hearts of men and women in our midst. And may they find comfort, may they find strength, may they find purpose, may they find salvation and peace through your word. Thank you, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Well, good morning. It's great to have you. I've got some announcements for you this morning. Uh, this uh, I, uh, choir practice, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. next Saturday, uh, 20th of March, and that's for our Easter service, uh, a Good Friday and uh, Easter Sunday service. So if you uh, would like to be involved in the choir, come along. You can slip straight in. We've got a great bunch of singers together really gearing up for a wonderful Easter service. Uh, our AGM. Now, at the moment, we are just still waiting for our auditor's report, so we may have to put that back, so stay tuned. So at the moment, we will let you know if it's going to take place or not. And uh, I can't even read what that says up there. Oh, the Mugra Passion Play. Who's been to the Mugra Passion Play? Well, that's on again, and it's on on the 27th and the 28th, and April the 2nd, the 3rd, and it's free but you do need to register online to get those tickets. They're free, but you have to register online, and there's some more information down the back. And our Easter service is about going from graves to gardens, how Jesus went into the grave and he died physically, and how God raised him from the dead, and he was found in the garden. So it was going to be a great weekend. Also, if you would like to join us uh, together during the week, we have connect groups that meet online and in person. So please come and see me if you'd like to do that. And then finally, we have different ways that you can give. You can give by direct deposit. Uh, you can give by credit card down the back on FPOS or Tithely. And also there is a box down there for cash offerings if you'd like to give. Can I just say thank you, church, for your continued support. And uh, we are keep on moving forward. In Jesus' name, so bless you for doing that. And also to keep up to date, keep following us online and you can go back and listen to previous sermons that have been spoken during the year. There's some great messages there and uh, follow us on Facebook and also if you'd like to be involved in church prayer, you can uh, let us know and we can connect you into that.